Holy cow, guys. Sorry about that. I almost forgot to put an episode out this week because I've been so busy bear hunting. Uh, but we're going to lash one together for you right now, and you're going you're gonna to dig it. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host, coming at you from the Broken Tine studio right here in Clark Fork, Idaho, enjoying the uh, the spring bear season. I, actually, I shouldn't say I'm, I'm frustrated with spring bear season, but I have somebody I think who's going to uh, kind of lead me in the right direction here, and he's been on the show before, and I'm going to introduce him in just a minute, but I want to talk about real quick... This episode, so like I kind of said in the intro there, um, I, I've been I've been just absolutely obsessed with my uh, my bear hunt. Um, it's been really frustrating, lots of ups and downs so far, but uh, I've been hitting my bear site every day for about 16 days straight, with the exception of one day we had we did like this elk seminar up here, and uh, I, I didn't hit it that day. But other than that. It's been taking up a lot of my time. So the point is, I realized, um, I think like Monday afternoon, that uh, I did not have an episode ready for this week. And so luckily, I've got a good friend who just shot a bear, and I want to talk to him about it. And I've got also, I'm going to put in here, uh, my buddy John Stallone, who works with Howl for Wildlife, uh, sent me some audio that he is, it's kind of like a, they, they call it the Conservation Corner Update. And what it is, is they go into all these details about what's going on with, you know, multiple anti-hunting legislations throughout the country. And he's kind of given everybody an update on it. Uh, and so the Howl Action Center is uh, needing needing your support and help and uh, anything we could do to help our fellow hunters throughout the country deal with some of these uh, some of this bad legislation that's coming out. I want to I want to be there for them. So I want to thank John Stallone for sending that audio over to me. I'm going to uh, tack it into the end of this episode for you guys. And I'd encourage you to give it a listen. Um, it's worth it. And so anything you could do to help, please do. So before we get there, though. You guys have uh, that have listened to the show may have heard him before, Mike Bozarth, who's kind of down in that, uh, what, Mike, uh, I can't remember what town, just out of Nampa, Idaho, aren't you? No, I'm north of that. I'm uh, Payette. That's where oh, that's right, I, Payette. I, I live, yeah. That's yeah. right, Payette. Poor you know what? Weezer. I've always called that Payetti. <laughs> Payetti, yeah. Payetti. I for so, I think I think I had an uncle or something uh, that called it Payetti once, and it's been stuck in my mind. But it's Payette. Well, well that explains some of the people here, right? <laughs> it could, it could. Uh, it, he was not a local Idahoan. Um, he was from Utah, and he'd be like, "Oh yeah, up in the Payetti area," because he used to go up there, and uh, they. I, I think they changed the unit to like a limited draw or something but he used to go up uh in that neck of the woods and hunt mule deer and so oh, yeah. um yeah. i know what you're talking about yeah 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 yeah. so i appreciate you coming on man and congratulations on a pretty sweet bear oh, thank you it was a it's quite an adventure so there's a couple reasons why i wanted to bring you on first of all uh mike you you are one of those super consistent guys that you uh, you really commit to your hunts you seem to I mean, I don't want to say every time, but you are you are more successful than I think you or other people may give you credit for. Um, you you just you're just like dependable. You, we know you're gonna notch a tag at some point, and this bear season was no exception. And I like the way that you kind of you know, the lifestyle that you have with hunting, you you do this traveling thing where you go to Nevada and work on the mine or whatever. What what do you do there? Yeah, I work in a gold mine out of Winnemucca. Do you ever, do you ever like that uh, song, that Johnny Cash song, "Got It One Piece at a Time"? Do you ever consider that a <laughs> gold mine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's one of those places where the gold is 
they say it's there, but we, we've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So they don't let you guys actually see the gold. Well, I've actually seen the gold one time. We had a, uh, when this company first bought us, they uh, sent a guy to take pictures for the mine mm-hmm. and video for the, you know, for the, for the stockholders or whatever. And so they let me go into where they pour the gold. So I actually saw the, uh, the gold, uh, you know, the final product, but that's the only time. Hmm. Okay, well, hopefully that improves in the future and we can work out an arrangement. <laughs> no, <you> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> That's, uh, so anyway, what I was saying is is you, you do that, you travel a lot, uh, you're on the road a lot. In fact, I feel like every time I post an episode, you, you comment on there, oh, I got it all, all downloaded and ready for my road trip because you're constantly right. on these road trips and uh, coming yes. back and forth. But then... You get home and you you know you do a lot of uh, physical fitness training. You do a lot of um, obviously you listen to a lot of hunting podcasts and a lot of homework and and you're just solid, man. You're just like we can we can kind of uh, cash the check before before it's even written, knowing that uh, you're out there <laughs> and, and it's oh, super boy, that's cool. That's put a lot. That's put a lot on it there. I I, I don't know that it. I'm particularly a good hunter. I just think I'm, I just, I refuse to quit. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's, know. there's gotta be, see, I'm like that too, Mike. I, I am not a great hunter, but I, I put in the effort. Like if I get a bear, I have, I have until the 30th, which today is what the 22nd, I think yeah. I have until the 30th. And, uh, if, if I get a bear between now and the 30th, it will be one of the most well-deserved, uh, notch tags I've ever had because I've really been putting in the effort. And what I'm saying with that is skill wise, there's, there's definitely some skill involved because I do this a lot where I, I, I get a, like just absolutely obsessive about what I'm hunting and, and I fully commit. And most of the time I don't end up notching a tag. <laughs> and so you do the same thing, but you actually notch tags. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, and and the time thing for me is is so much factor because there's obviously stuff up to do around here, and mm-hmm. I'm gone half of the time, and so I might have one day to run up on the mountain and put out bait, and then I may not be back for ten days. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so and so my setup has to be done accordingly, and and I have to pretty much take what I can get too. You know, I I don't, you know. I don't, I'm not after any specific animal. And like this year, I, I, wa- I wanted a brown one, mm-hmm. a brown color face. And, you know, that's, that's what you what got, got, right? Yeah. 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 I, it's, it's funny you say that. I, I was, when I started out, and I think it's because of how many bears I had coming in on my barrel last year, um, I set a barrel, and, and I mean, I had 15, somewhere around 10 to 15 different bears coming in. All the time, like all hours of the day, all this stuff. So I got kind of cocky about it, and I set this barrel, and I I sat out there. I passed on a couple of small bears that have come in, and now I'm kicking myself because um, we had this storm come in like a week ago, and ever since then, I, I'm not seeing that one bear, and he's not teeny, uh, but he's not a big bear. But at this point, we're getting down to it, I'd shoot him. But I, I was kind of, I went in with kind of a bigger head thinking, oh, I'm going to wait for a big old, you know, boar to walk in. And uh, it's just not panning out. It's not paying off for me. I'm in a weird area too. But anyway, I'm not getting the bears I was last year. So uh, your your baiting setup is interesting because you like r- run this, I don't know, rope or something between two trees and hang like a mini metal garbage can thing. Can you explain that? <laughs> yeah, I've been using it for a couple of years, uh, actually two years prior to this, and it's worked really good on the bears I was getting in. Um, when I first set it up this year, I didn't even have the barrel. I just used the log. I had to move because we had all this snow. Yeah, me and too. So I had me to, too. So I had to move. I moved down the mountain, and I found a spot, you know, and I just basically threw bait under a log and poured molasses on it and stuff like that, and they'd have they'd tear it up and have it gone and and then be bored and rip my cameras off the trees and stuff. And, and then, uh, I finally, I had to put a new barrel together. And so I, it's just a 20 gallon trash can and I drill a hole in the top and the bottom. And then I run a cable through it all the way through. And they put a big cable clamp and washer on the bottom of it. 
And then in the sides, about three, four inches up, I'll put little, I don't know, three, two and a half inch holes, like three of them around it up from the bottom. Uh-huh. And then, and then I'll hang it from the tree where I estimate that the bears can reach up there and bat it, but they can't get a hold of it. Oh, you know, gotcha. really, really get a hold of it. And so, th- and then I'll use a cable clamp to, to seal the lid down and then I'll hang it up there. And it's, it's worked really good. It, you know, it, I mean, because like I said, the, uh, it's a long time between the times that I, I bait and the times I come back. So I have to use like a trick or shaker or whatever you call it mm-hmm. to kind of, to keep them interested while I'm gone. And, you know, it didn't work out real great this year. I, that bigger bear came in there and, and uh, he, he got his nails underneath that lid and turned it upside down. And I mean, it was still hanging there, but he just dumped it all out oh, and yeah. bent it and twice. And then just, so I raised it up a little more and he came back in, couldn't get under it. So he just smashed it. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think I'm going to have to readjust my tactics next year, but it was worked really good. I got some amazing pictures and videos of these guys yeah. batting it around, I've swinging seen, from I've it. I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and it's just so much fun. I think, I don't know, I just, I, have, I get as much fun out of looking at the pictures. Oh, I know. And just and seeing what seeing what they do and, you know, then actually coming down to shooting one. And last year, uh, I didn't hunt it myself. I saved it for my son wanted to hunt. So he came up and we didn't end up getting one, but we had Bears Command. And so this is kind of the year I, I was going to hunt it. And so, but that's, that's my setup. It's just a yeah. trash can hanging from a tree. I try to get it out far enough. They can't climb the tree. Yeah. That's what it. I was going right. to ask. That's, that's going to yeah. be the tricky part because I, I've been using those, uh, those, those big scent balls from Batum 907 and those work really well. I've noticed a decline in bears hitting my bait ever since they figured out how to climb the tree and actually bat it down and steal it. <laughs> Yep. And, and, and my, my, uh, the, the bears that are coming in are, are fewer because of that. So, uh, that's the hard part, but I like what you said, um, talking about, uh, the enjoyment you get out of like just watching them and checking your camera and stuff like, here's, here's what happens, man. I'll, I'll get up to my spot and you know, you could tell when your barrel's been hit and especially, God, what was that? I think Monday I showed up over there and that this little sucker, absolutely destroyed my damn barrel i mean he bent the crap out of it somehow got the lid off bent the crap out of the top of it so i can't put the lid back on now so i i took these uh ratchet straps and (laughs) i'm doing what i can to keep the lid on but i mean it's gonna and it's funny it happened in three minutes because he came in at like I, i don't remember what time it's like um 7:43 7:43 a.m. and then the next picture is at 7:46 a.m. and it's like the the barrel is on the ground smashed. Um, yep. I mean not <laughs> totally on the ground. It's just leaned over because I have it chained. Um, but anyway, what I was saying is like when I get there and I can tell a bear's been on it, I have a hard time even sitting there hunting. I I just want to go check my camera. I want to see the bears, you know. Yeah. And uh, I'm like a kid in a candy store with it. <laughs> so. I want to talk real quick uh, about this sow and heat stuff because you feel like it's it made a difference for you on this bear. And uh, you, when you first sent that, cause, so for those listening, Mike sent, sent me this text message. He's like, yeah, I put the sow and heat stuff. Was it the Batum 907 stuff? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, he's like, he's like I, I put the sow and heat stuff um into a nylon and hung it and so you text me that and my wife was sitting there and i'm like babe do you have any nylons and she's like no I haven't. she's like i don't have any nylons i, I don't wear nylons i because I, I i was like what the hell is a nylon i kind of knew <laughs> so she explains it to me and lo and behold we don't have any nylons so i had to get like this thin dress sock and i stretched it out and uh, I kind of did the same thing, but I want you to explain kind of what you did with that sound heat. Well, the first time, you know, I, I do, you know, when you get into June and, and like, I'm no bear hunting expert and I'm, this is, I'm learning so much every year. And I follow a lot of, a lot of people, people have been on your show that are really, pro, you know, prolific at this, mm-hmm. but, but it, so I, I, I had this bear and heat stuff and I've had it in the 
garage fridge for a while, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this stuff. And first, first time I took it up, I just, I took some and I just, it says spread around. I, I, I rubbed it on the saplings and stuff around there. And I did, I noticed when I came back that that boar was there and he had, and he actually had a sow with him. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, that time I forgot to bring it. And so I didn't have it. And then, uh, but he would come in after that and he had, there was a, he had the sow and, and they were, you know, I got pictures of him nosing and courting and all this stuff. And it's really cool. Hmm. And it was only at night. Right. It was, yeah, it, yeah. It was, he, he would only come in at night. And so and when I went up this time, I, I did that and, and I put it in a, I found a piece of nylon, like it was like a nylon and I put, I put it in there and I smooshed it in real good. So it, the gel kind of poked through the holes and I just took out a piece of power, uh, paracord and tossed it up in a tree branch, you know, about eight, eight feet up in the air. And I r- rubbed some on the, on the, uh, saplings because I really only had two days. And so I had the day I baited and then the next day I had dedicated to, to the hunt because it's a long ways for me to go over there. And so, mm-hmm. You know, so it's, it was worth it. It was worth a shot to me, and so that's what I did. And lo and behold, you know, he came in. He came, of course, he came in after. You know, he came in. I don't usually get bears coming in this right away after I bait, but it was worth a try, and because of my time thing. And I don't know, it wasn't uh, six o'clock or six thirty. I had my first bear come in. Huh. And uh, and he was a I, I, he, he was a boar too, but he wasn't just, he wasn't big you know, big big Jake, <laughs> you know he was big he, he, he was a big good Jake. you know he was a good bit yeah. big Jake and so yeah well, I'll tell you about big Jake here in a minute. Um, I don't know if you wanted me to get into the actual hunt story or what. Yeah, but, yeah, go go for it. I, I'm so, this, this so stuff... how this go ahead. Yeah, so I so I think this had I think it had something to do with the bear, the, the boars starting to come in because I didn't, I don't typically have these big bears. I have, you know, the two and a half, three and a half year olds. Mm-hmm. And I don't usually get a, you know, a big bears coming in. And especially this year, I find out I have a outfitter down the mountain. That's, that was also baby. Oh, and I didn't, and how, I'd never seen a soul on this mountain. How, and I how far in, from your bait was his bait? Uh, probably about a third of a mile. Wow, pretty Down, close. Okay. And it, yeah, and it's on the tra- it's twenty yards off my trail coming up the mountain, and I didn't even realize he was there. I went, I baited, and then I came down. It was the week before, and I came down to, and I, I don't use the same pack for baiting and hunting, mm-hmm. and so I came down. I was switching out all my gear into my hunting pack, and I see this movement off to my right, and twenty yards away, I see a bucket go up onto a log, and I went, what? So I walk over there and, hey, you know, we introduced each other ourselves, you know, and yeah, he's turned out to be an outfitter that, you know, he goes, how long have you been baiting up here? I said, about four years. <laughs> he goes, oh, and anyway, so we had, we talked, real nice guy, mm-hmm. really polite, you know, and he says, well, I got a 100 coming in maybe this week and then we're out of here. And I said, well, I won't be here for a week anyway. So anyway, I didn't realize I was, com- I didn't realize I was competing with him for, for bears. Right. Yeah. And so, uh. But it worked out, and so I baited, and I put out put out that scent, and I traded my gear out and got in my blind, and and I'm tired. I packed bait up, you know, two loads of bait up plus my gear up that day. It's a hump up there for me, and um, so I'm tired, and I'm sitting there, and I look and I see a bear, and it's a good bear, and I was, you know. I got to admit, I was cold already because I'd been sweating and I was, I just started, something I don't normally do, I just started shaking, right? Yeah, and I, I, you know, it's not like I don't get, I don't get, you know, uh, a little buck fever now and then, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. But I mean, I was literally shaking out of my, you probably heard my teeth chatter. Oh, wow. Because, I mean, I was shaking and, and personally, you know, and so he, he came in, he took his time. And and I I sent my my son an injury message said I got a good bear a big bear 
So he comes, but he comes in the back, and I don't know if you've seen the pictures of how the barrels hung. He came in the back side of it, and all I had was his head and his front and his front of him. And he, I, I didn't have a shot, you know, and I didn't want to take a frontal on a bear. I don't know how that works, and yeah, you know, maybe it'll work, you know. I'm, I, you know, I'll, I'll do it on an elk, but I, I haven't. Tell even tell it on bear. So anyway, he, there was something he did like, and he ran off the way he came. And uh, I was like, wow. So I was settled down. And then, uh, I don't know, it was probably an hour later, this other bear comes in. And he ended up coming around the front right where, you know, I wanted him. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that, and then uh, I'd like to say I made this beautiful shot or, or beautiful execution. of The shot was, but the execution was not. <laughs> Oh, what do I you, went, oh, go ahead. You know, go ahead. What do you mean by that? Because I, I was while you were talking, I was pulling up. I was getting back on your Instagram because you uh, were talking about coming in from the back, and I'm just trying to get a visual. Are you where on that one picture where you've got the two trees, your trash can is hung, and there's a bear standing up messing with it? Is are you behind that angle, or are you like yeah. behind the bear? Yeah, that's like a side angle at it. That's so you're you're like if if I was standing there in person, you would be off to the right. Yeah, I, I okay. would be directly facing directly facing the two tr- spread of the two trees. Gotcha. Okay. Where, where that? Well, I got two cameras and they're both on that one side, but one's more so than the other. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so so then when the bear's standing, you can barely see the barrel behind it because of the trees in the way. So I'm more direct direct in line with the two trees. And okay. Got it, got it. And what did you mean by um, you made a good shot, but the execution wasn't there, or something like that? Oh, oh yeah. And and, and this is where I put my put myself on blast here. You know, I I have a, you know you sit in the I use a ground blind. Because yeah, and you're you're I'm, bow hunting, just to clarify. And, yeah, yeah. This is archery hunting, mm-hmm. and, and and I use a ground blind for a couple of reasons. You know, one I don't like trees being up in trees, and the other I don't like being up in trees. And, yeah, that's and, the same uh, with me. I, I have a third reason, Mike. I, I I'm a I'm a cheap bastard, and I don't want to I don't want to buy a tree stand and then have somebody steal it. Yeah, well, the, the ground line works good for me, except for I had I learned a very harsh lesson last year when the bears get run out of bait and they get bored. Oh, and yeah. And if you leave your yeah, if you leave your your ground blind, it, it is very vulnerable. And huh. so now when I so now when I do it I have to take it down, hang it in the tree, or, you know, or, or something. Yeah. And so but when I sit down in the blind, so I have to set it up every time. So there's a risk there too, because it's something new on the landscape. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but it didn't seem to care. And I always practice drawing and getting my, you know, everything when I'm in the blind, you know, when I first get there I make sure everything's kosher. Well, I went to draw my bow when he find, you know, he was just sitting there for the longest time, but he had a sapling in the way. And I sat there for the longest time, took some video of him, and, and you know, I was pretty well settled down then by then. And, and I go to draw my bow, and I'm having trouble drawing my bow. And it's like, so I know it's not, I've drawn my bow three or four times in there already that day, so I know I can do it. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, right about the time I hit full draw, I made the, the biggest rookie mistake you can make with my finger in front of the trigger. And oh. that bow went that bow went off. And you know what happens when you do that normally, right? It yep. flies into the oblivion. Yep. Right? I yep. center punched him. Oh. That arrow center punched him. And he went down like a rock. No kidding. And yeah, and and it I was looking at him, you know, they're flopping around and it's like there's not much penetration there. So I, I, I knocked another arrow and made a calmer pass three shot, you know, mm-hmm. but it was, so it's embarrassing to say that, but that's what happened, you know? Well, and, I mean, it and, worked uh, out though. Yeah, it worked out. Um, so you, when, s- Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was, was going to say back to the bear and heat or the sow and heat. Um, if, if you, when after I went down there and I took my pictures and I was skinning him, I was, I guess I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention to stuff. And I heard a roof, roof, roof. And, and I, 
turned around and here's here's Big Jake. Oh no! He's coming in. <laughs> he's he is coming in, just taking his time. Could care less that I'm there, and I'm standing underneath that tree with the sow and heat at the branch. Or skinning that bear, that, little, that bear out. And he saw he saw you, so he's kind of huffing and puffing at you. Yeah, he was. He, yeah, he was huffing, and you're just snapping his teeth a little bit, but he wasn't aggressive, you know. Huh. And but but he caught me off guard, you know. I mean, you know, coming up from behind you when you're bent over. And, yeah, yeah. And and so he got about. Good thing uh, he didn't think you were a sow. Yeah, well, you, know, you know, I'm standing in it right you now, <laughs> and the. No, I, I, you know, the threat never really occurred to me, but I, what did occur is like, if I had waited 20 minutes, then uh, you know this guy would have been there. Yeah. And but there's I no didn't way. expect him. No yeah. way of knowing that. No, and you know, and I, like I always say, I I never pass up a shot the good Lord puts in front of me. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. And so I was perfectly happy with this barrel, but so and my phone's on the ground. I, I can't get. I got gloves on. I can't get any video. You know, and that's what I'm thinking, right? Well, I'd like to get a picture of this, right? Yeah, that'd be and, cool, you know, man. But he got to about 30, 35 yards, and I decided that was enough. <sighs> and, you know, I said, hey, bear. And he picked his head up, he looked, and he wasn't sure what I was or, or didn't care. And he, he just, you know, I, I smell something really good over there, and there's something that's in my way. So he huffed a little bit. And then I said, hey, bear. And he just... Ram, you know, wandered away. He didn't, and then he went back off about I don't know, eighty yards, and watched me for a while. What what and time of day is this? This is about by then. This is like seven thirty, eight o'clock. A.M. or P.M. P.M. Oh, okay, okay. So he came in in the daylight, which he hadn't done before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's what kind of what led me to believe that that that's he smelled heat. something. Yeah. That he would, you know, and like I say, I'm I'm new. I'm really learning so much about this and i've heard other people talk about bears coming in and watching them while they're you know taking care of a bear and, did and you stuff. did so you didn't have like a second tag you could have whacked him too oh no down here we just got one. <laughs> oh, gotcha is that that's different i didn't know it was different down there like yeah, i, I, I can get a second you, bear bear tag yeah i think you north idaho guys can have to get two bear tags we can only buy yeah. one yeah, I, th- I, Thank yeah, you. I'm pretty sure I haven't bought one yet because I want to, you know, kill a bear first. <laughs> but yeah. if I do, and and the reason is, Mike, is is uh, I I feel like this this bear hunting, specifically the baiting, because of the the advantage you have in the and the opportunity you have to to watch these bears and learn, it's it's quickly climbing up the rank for me in terms of what my favorite hunt is. I don't think it'll ever replace like September elk archery elk hunting but it is uh it, it is like i am enjoying the shit out of it like i don't i don't even want I, I i'd be bummed if i shot a bear like today because i still have over a week left and and i enjoy it so much and so yeah. um, that's why i didn't shoot those little ones that came in you know and and not that because i'm not picky i always like what you said uh on the i think it was like the first time i had you on the show you said my trophy room is my freezer and and I yep. really like that statement because uh, I'm like that too, but I the only the, my biggest thing with with uh, me being picky when I first started right right now I'm shooting the first bear that walks in but but what it has been is I didn't want to end my bear season um, yeah so anyways anyways uh, and I'm right there with you and, and, it is very high on my list yeah yeah I I I it's so funny too because I. Most of my hunting life, I've just, it's not like I was opposed to bear hunting. I just had no interest in it. I'm like, eh, I don't want to go bear hunting. What am I going to do with a bear? You know, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to learn a whole new thing. And I spend so much time during elk and deer seasons. Like, I don't want to add another one. Now that I'm getting older, I've got a lot more free time in terms of, you know, what, uh, my kids aren't little anymore, I guess, put it that way. So I can spend a lot more time in the woods. In fact, I take them now. Um, yeah. And and I didn't realize what I had a I had a misperception as to what bear hunting was, and I didn't realize like it's an adventure. And I don't care if you you're running hounds or if you're baiting or you're spot and stock, it, all of it all of it is a ball. Because I I did some uh, spot and stock when uh, but before I can get up to where my bait site is, 
uh, snow wise. And, and that was a ball. That was a ball. I saw one bear way too far to shoot. But anyway, it, it, that's, I think, what it is. And to your point of that, uh, that the, the sound heat gel, it's, it's funny that you brought that the way you noticed how um, it changed when the bears were coming in or what bears were coming in or whatever, because I put some out like two weeks ago or I don't know, 10 days. I don't know. I am confused on the days. It might've been last week. The day I, I put some out, I spread, and I was telling you this before we recorded, I spread some out on a tree or like a log. And that next morning I had those two big boars come in and then it rained and kind of washed it away and they haven't been back since. So I, I haven't reapplied that. And so now uh, I'm like you, man. This is only this is only actually my second year baiting and my third year actually taking bear hunting serious. Um, and yeah. I have yet to shoot one, just to be clear. Um, so anyway, point being, I put I, I I after you told me what you did, I put some in that sock and hung it in a tree with that 550 paracord or whatever, uh, just like you did. And I, I really smashed it into the sock and kind of spread it. Uh, but you did say something that I'm a little concerned about. You you refrigerate that sow and heat stuff? Am I supposed to? Oh, I don't know if you are or not. I I have a little refrigerator in the in the, my garage that I use for uh, well my to much to my wife's disgust. I I use I put like my trapping sense and oh gotcha you know the, you know anything that is in tubes or jars or anything like that i'll put it in there yeah so you open it up and you get hit by a skunk and, <laughs> and, and, and yeah well that's how and heat but, stuff is not super pleasant smelling no and i don't you know i've had it for around for a couple of years and mm-hmm. you know and, and, and of course you know jess has got some you know Bainham 907 i I, you know, I, we, we swear by it, and I, oh, yeah. you know, I, I was throwing throwing everything I had in the book up there this time too. You know, I mean, they had, um, you know, blueberry muffin and oh, yeah. raspberry delight, and they had, you know, molasses with blueberry. I I packed, you know, some gallons of molasses up there with blueberry in it, and I mean, I threw the works at it, you know, but I, but I had the regular bears, and then I had this guy and another boar, but. He just came in and left. And, so how did, and he ma- how did that end with him? I, I don't know if you were going there because I was going to ask you about that. So the big, big so he, Jake big comes Jake. in, snapping his teeth and, and huffing at you. And you say, hey, bear. And then I think we got derailed there. What what happened after that? Oh, oh so, he, so he wanders off about 80 yards or so, I'm guessing. And he just stands there and, and watches me for a while. And I kind of tried to go back to work there. I'm trying to beat the daylight and get this bear skinned out and i you know i'm kind of having my head on a little bit of a swivel i, I don't think he, you know like I say, he wasn't aggressive or anything he was just interested and so but he eventually disappeared and then probably 20 30 minutes later i hear a branch crack off to my left and here's another bear that had come in oh he probably came in 40 50 yards and just as I looked up and saw him, he winded me, and oh, he, he took off like a freight train, huh. you know. And it was a different, it was a different bear. And I, I couldn't tell if it was a boar or a sow, but it was, it was a good bear. And it's like, holy mackerel, where are these bears coming from? And and you know, this is with a bear down, yeah. and you know, and they didn't seem to care. And, and you know, the one bear was te- definitely didn't when he winded me didn't. You know, didn't stay in the same zip code. The first bear, he had my win too, but he did, he, he wasn't as care. concerned. Yeah, I yeah. think I think that if you just had the blueberry muffin smell, uh, that wouldn't have played out that way. But I think that sow and heat, you know, you think about it like hunting elk in September and how much they just kind of lose their minds. You know, they they don't yeah. care. Um, they they throw a lot of caution to the wind. I I feel like that's what what is going on with that sound heat stuff. He's just super interested in that. Yeah. And I'm no expert, right? And I I can only speculate, but Mm -hmm. my guess was that second bear was just coming in to eat. Oh, gotcha. And the first bear was coming in to breed Mm -hmm. or because he smelled something. Now that's just because that might've been at the sow, the big sow. Yeah. That big sow was with that, with uh, big, big Pete or whatever. Big Jake, oh, yeah. Big Jake, Big Jake. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a he had a cinnamon sow with him a couple of times. Well, that I could tell was nighttime pictures, but um, and so that might have been that bear. 
and and uh, but that that one left the country. I mean, it sounded like a herd of elk going through the trees. <laughs> um, but and then a little while later, I I think Big Jake was three four hundred yards up the mountain, you know, b- b- huffing a little bit, huh. you know, just saying, "Are you going to leave or what?" You know, and and uh, I did, and, but. That was uh, that was my experience with them. I saw a whole bunch it. of elk on the way out. Now you got a freezer but, full of full of bear meat. Uh, you you mentioned you've got some bear chili going in the in the crock pot or not the crock pot, the pressure cooker, right? Yep, the, the Insta pot or whatever. Yeah, it's like an Insta pot. Yeah, and just, I mean, I just get on when you called. Sweet. And, uh, yeah. I'll be there. Sure I'll after. be there around supper. That's right. Come on down. <laughs> Just kidding. I gotta go try to kill my own bear. That's right. I don't know. I hope you do. I can't wait for that. You've earned it. No, that's uh, that's that's fantastic, Mike. You you earned that bear for sure. I I know I know how much work you put in, um, and it's always I always like your perception, and you you motivate me because um, I I feel like you know there's there's a lot of how old are you, Mike? Not to put you on the spot. I'm, no, I'm 62. I'll be 63 right before elk season starts. Okay, so that's my point. I I know so many guys that are that are around that age that have thrown in the towel because they've they you know not all of them but they've they've kind of allowed themselves to get out of the, the physical condition that is necessary to do this. And and you motivate me because you know I'm in my early 40s now, uh, and things hurt a little bit more. You know those it, it's it's a little tougher getting up the mountain than it was you know 20 years ago. And I'm not that old. Um, get, you know I it's just not I, I don't I don't struggle, but I I worry sometimes about what it's going to be in 10 or 20 years. Like I, you know my knees have severe arthritis from from the military. Um, but I can overcome it as long as I stay in shape. I notice when they hurt is when I get like sedentary and I, and I, I don't move much or, or if I drive a long ways, you know, a six hour drive in the truck will kill my knees. Have, uh, oh yeah. It hurts um, my... Yeah. So, so that's why it's, uh, you're an inspiration, man. Um, <laughs> it's awesome. And that's what I, that's what I try to be. I, I don't, I don't like to post pictures to say, Hey, look, I climbed this mountain. And, you know, it's like, hey, yeah. look, I climbed this mountain and you can too. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and that's what, you know, that's what it's about for me. It's, 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 you know. There's nothing braggadocious about what you do. You're just showing what you are doing and, and making people understand that like, it's a, it's this mentality. If I could do it, you could do it too kind of thing. Um, and, and that helps. I, I mean, that helps a lot of people. And, and I know there's, there's folks that, um, you know that I know personally. I mean, they they're they're not even as old as you, but they won't even hunt anymore uh, because they're worried about their physical condition, or or you know they've they're they're just they're so out of shape that you know going a, a hundred yards from the truck uphill just about they 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 just about kill over you know and and it's sad. I I just don't want to be like that ever. I want to be like eighty. Well, I don't know if I'll live that long, but. Uh, if I'm 80 and oh, I'm still, if I'm still walking, <laughs> if I'm still walking, dude, I'm going hunting. And so yep. anyways, and, and you know, it's not, you know, if, if, if I quit doing stuff and I think my wife, you know, bless her heart, you know, she's extremely patient with me. And as mm-hmm. far as, you know, my hunting and stuff like that. And I try to be really respectful, especially bear season. I, I you know, I try to only go on days she's working and stuff like that. Now elk season, well, whole bets are off, but. Yeah. Um, you know, that's just, that's a block of time there. But if I was to just quit and, you know, and shoot back in October, where, you know, I had pneumonia, I could have quit right there. But, mm. you know, that, that, that drove me, you know, and I think that's what I try to help show is you can do anything up there. Or, you know, there's so much to do if you want, if you really want to do it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You still playing guitar? Uh, occasionally, I'm staring at it right now. I've been thinking of some some songs like th- that I want to write about when I'm up on the mountain and everywhere I am, there's hunters everywhere, and I want to say thank you, Randy Newbert, or some song like that, you know. <laughs> or I, a really good song is "Thank Big Jake." He wasn't 
thinking I was a sow while I was bent over uh, my yeah. bear. Yeah, yeah. You know, all sorts of country yeah. songs come out of this stuff. There's man. lots of them, you know, and that's the, it goes back to that time thing, right? It's like, mm-hmm. well, think, you know, it's like, man, you got to make time. I pulled out, I pulled and, out the guitar the other day, man, and uh, I was thinking of you. Uh, we, we were around the campfire and, and uh, playing, just, you know, screwing around, playing music all night long. Uh, it was just me and my wife, and I, I thought, man, it'd be cool. Like, if if, uh, if you lived closer, you can you can hang out around the fire. We could play music all night. It'd be fun. That would be awesome. And then go kill yeah, something the so next day. Fun. Yeah. That's right. Or, or pretend to, or go try. Or try. Look, you know, I mean, at least try. Yeah. You know, look for mushrooms or whatever. Yep. We can we can at least go out there and talk shit about all the other hunters that are out there. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, I appreciate it. I know this is uh, kind of short and sweet and quick, uh, but I, I got to get up to my barrel, man. I, I'm going to go spend uh, the rest of the day up there, but I'm going to put this episode out. I, I appreciate right I loved hearing yeah, what the are you story. Waiting for? Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to hear your story because I, I was super excited when uh, I found out you got one. And what was that, Monday? Yeah, it was on Monday, yeah. Yeah, Monday night or whatever. And so yeah. I you know, you you posted that you'd got one and I think I didn't even see it until I got back off of my, my barrel. Um and uh, super exciting. So I appreciate you sharing the story and saving me from uh, totally forgetting to post an episode this week because <laughs> I, I'm too busy bear hunting. <laughs> That's so, why. Ain't nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. Really understand. Yeah, man. I, I I hope so. I hope so. I think during the, yeah. the next hunting season, I'm going to record a shitload of episodes in August, and that way I don't have to do them in September while I'm gone, because I always stress out about that. So anyway. All right, brother. Well, uh, let's keep right. in touch, and yeah. um, I appreciate you coming on the show, and congratulations on a great bear. Oh, thank you. I'm so blessed. I'm just so grateful and blessed just to be able to do these things that so many others can't do. Well, yeah. we're all blessed but to know can. you, brother. Yeah, I'm glad you called. Let's take a quick break to give our show sponsors some well-deserved love. Let's start with Scree Extreme Mountain Gear, high-performance hunting attire and gear, scientifically tested camo patterns, complete layering systems, and in my opinion, the finest merino wool products to keep you warm, dry, and comfortable. It's all backed by a great company. Some of my personal favorites of the in the Scree lineup are the hard scrabble pants uh, for early to mid season, and then as it gets colder, I switch to the Kodiak pants for late season. The Bridger glassing mitts are like game changers, and I love the Nebo rain gear. Scree offers great packages on the website as bundles, like the elk bundle, that will completely outfit you for your favorite hunt. Oh, and my favorite part. You won't need to refinance your house to get outfitted. Try the starter bundle for less than 500 bucks. It's an insane deal. With the VIP sizing guarantee, you can exchange something that doesn't fit for free. I just had to do this for something that I got my wife. It was a little big, so I just sent it back. They covered the shipping both ways and exchanged it for the right size. So go to ScreeGear.com and at checkout, use promo code the Western Huntsman for 15% off and free shipping. Phelps Game Calls, one thing that I love about companies that are born out of hunting is their story. Like Phelps Game Calls, the American success story that walks us through how something started small and grew into something big. Like Phelps, he started this company kind of as a hobby in his garage in 2009. Now, a little over a decade later, Phelps is one of the premier hunting call companies on the planet for good reason. They're the most realistic calls on the market, and that is saying something. Check out the amp lineup. For predator calls like the three pack POR one, two, three, or the fawn in distress, check those out. Turkey calls, get a diaphragm, a pot call, or a box call, and a complete line of waterfowl calls. Hit up the website and at checkout, use promo code Huntsman10 for 10% off. Phelps game calls, get them close. The Elk Collective. The best investment for hunting success is what's between your ears. Having elk hunting knowledge is what separates those who succeed every once in a while against those who notch tags every year. There's a very fine line there, and there's a perfect amount of time if you're listening to this now to get through the entire course before September. Improve your chances with a virtual course of over 140 videos that cover things like how to get elk tags throughout the West, scouting and e-scouting, beginner to advanced elk calling, gear, fitness, nutrition, shooting processes, hunting scenarios, strategies, and tons more. They've got some very big names 
on this platform that give you their personal expertise as you go through the course. It's the best way to make you the best elk hunter as you get into the woods. So go to theelkcollective.com and use promo code the Western Huntsman for $20 off. It's normally $89, so when you use my promo code, it's going to be the best $69 you've spent on elk hunting, and I guarantee you it's worth every penny. Check it out, guys. Hoffman Boots, let me give you guys a piece of advice from a dude with many miles on his feet. Never skimp on quality hunting boots. Hoffman Boots is a fourth-generation, family-owned company based in North Idaho. I've been sporting a pair of Hoffmans for close to a decade, particularly I like the Hoffman Explorer in the 8-inch. In my most humble opinion, again, Hoffman offers the most comfortable hunting boot that does the least amount of damage to my feet after several miles on the mountain. Very little break-in period on these boots, by the way. Uh, I took them right out of the box and went on a crazy elk hunt, not even a blister. For hunting, they have the Explorers in the Summit boot offered in insulated and non-insulated. And ladies, check out the new women's Hoffman Explorer 400. They also carry lineman boots, winter pack boots, logging boots, and hiking boots. Get totally outfitted at HoffmanBoots.com and at checkout. As you know, it's coming. Use promo code, all caps lock, HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off. Last but not least, Tacticam. If you're interested in self-filming your hunts, whether for you know memories or making hunting content, check out the Tacticam products like the Spotter LR, Tacticam 5.0, and the Film Through Scope system, all of which are available at thewesternhuntsman.com, which helps support our fight against the anti-hunting movement. But my favorite is the Tacticam Reveal cell cams. I use these cell cams all over my property, and I'm like obsessed with monitoring the wildlife in real time with these cameras. They not only text me instantly when a buck or a bear is cruising through, my reveals make for excellent security systems. I know when the FedEx dude is delivering packages way down at the bottom of our driveway. And I also know if some knucklehead shows up to try to steal them. I know when someone's trespassing or if I have the kind of wildlife roaming around that I don't want, you know, like a coyote. And uh, I quickly react with my cat lack reflexes. Great for trappers, great for hunters, uh, security, anything. Guys, check it out at Tacticam.com because I don't have the reveals on my website right now. Uh, Let them know I sent you. Tacticam.com. Let's get back to the show. Here we go. Hi, I'm John Stallone. Welcome to Howl for Wildlife's Conservation Corner. Your favorite host has stepped up to support your hunting and fishing heritage by agreeing to share our message on their platform. Each month, we will be releasing a show discussing the current issues surrounding hunting and fishing. So be sure to thank them for all they do, and thank you for tuning in. Now let's jump into this episode. Hi, welcome to Howl for Wildlife's Action Center Review. I have uh, Travis Hall with us on, and uh, Travis is one of our bill researchers and content writers, and uh, so he has hands-on experience with the uh, the current bills we are working on in our Action Center. So, what's going on, man? Hey, John. How's it going? Appreciate you having me on here today. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, moving forward, now we're doing this... Uh, this action center review uh once i think we're going to be doing it like once a month and um so we're going to probably have you on more often since you're directly involved with them so awesome yeah i'd love to be on whenever whenever the need arises awesome so um i guess let's just well let's get a little quick rundown about you um so people know who we're talking with and uh and then we'll we'll jump into some of these these actions that we're working on Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a freelance writer and I write primarily about hunting, fishing, conservation related content. Um, obviously I write for you guys, uh, in the action center quite a bit here lately and, uh, do a lot of writing for meat eater as well. And I've had a few articles in field and stream, uh, here lately. So I do that. And then I also report for some, uh, local, publications that i'm based out of montana western montana so you know i'm I'm writing about hunting and conservation for a a few local outlets as well here so awesome 
So uh, we got a bunch of stuff going on still, which is crazy. I didn't think this late in the season we would have this many uh, many things going on. But uh, mm-hmm. you know, typically bill seasons like what January through April for, mm-hmm. for the most part, and here we are mid June. Yeah. So um, let's talk about this. Uh, let's the North Carolina Bear one. We'll start off with that, and if you could give us an okay. in- overview of that bill, and then. We'll kind of dive into it a little bit. Yeah, so that bill, um, it was basically a response to an action by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, which is just the state agency that that administers the wildlife there in North Carolina. Um, but, you know, it's been several months now, but they they have expanded or they're attempting to expand their uh, bear hunting opportunity in the western part of the state, uh, western North Carolina's mountainous uh, terrain, quite a bit of public land, at least for you know eastern standards. They've got about a million acres between the Pisgah and the Nantahala mm-hmm. National Forest there. But the yeah, the commission decided that because bear populations have been expanding, growing in North Carolina, they wanted to open up some opportunities in a few areas that had formerly been designated as sanctuaries uh, that was the terminology used in the 1970s when they kind of set this up but mm-hmm. uh, these were areas that were off limits to bear hunting for a long time but now since numbers have rebounded so well the uh the wildlife commission decided to open up some limited uh, opportunity hunting there some like limited entry draw stuff mm-hmm. um when that when they did that, they were challenged by a lot of animal rights groups uh, in that area. Uh, they, they just met a lot of opposition. Uh, local media kind of latched on to the controversy of it all, as they tend to do. And it got a little blown out of proportion, I would say. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it passed either way within the commission and the rule should have gone into effect, um, but then it got challenged in the legislature by the, the same animal rights group. They uh, they sent in quite a few letters, hundreds of letters that um, caused the the rule to go into a review process with the legislature. So then a, after that, a bill was introduced um, to kind of strike this rule down, but that's not that's not a given yet. So they just have to, you know, kind of keep an eye on that one. Right. And so I noticed that I, I had read some articles about it that were t- basically, it was a lot of people were misunderstanding what was mm-hmm. going on. And that's why they were so up in arms about it. Like, uh, I think the word sanctuary was with, was throwing people off is that we were going to go, you know, hunt in these like fenced off, uh, you know, right. places and stuff like that. I was, there was quite a bit of that I saw going around. Um, mm-hmm. wh- do you know, do you have the numbers of what the bear population was and what it's become in these areas? You know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but when I was reporting on this at the time, I talked to a, a bear biologist there. And she told me that, you know, in the 1970s, it was, they were dwindling. I mean, the bear was, the black bear in North Carolina was all but um, gone from the area. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's when they designated those sanctuaries. And like you said, that terminology is a little problematic now um, because it kind of, it makes people think of like a national park or some, Mm -hmm. you know, somewhere that hunting would should never be allowed but when they designated them in the 70s it was with the understanding that once the, these populations rebounded uh, there would be some hunting opportunity allowed and that's just kind of that's where they're at now and i don't have the exact numbers but i've been told by bear biologists in the state that they're just they're thriving mm-hmm. bear numbers particularly in the western part of the state um so and this was just designed to kind of address that and and manage that population because human bear conflict is on the, seems to be on the rise there. 
um, particularly near the Smoky Mountains. Yeah, I I remember now. I'm not going to – don't quote me on the numbers, but from what I understood from what I was reading, it went from like 5,000 animals in like the 90s to like 30,000 today. Mm-hmm. Like it's yeah. crazy, crazy exploded. Yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, it, I wouldn't be surprised if that if that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I mean, like I said, don't quote us on this. Uh, look it up, but I know it's pretty, pretty darn close to to those numbers. Something very, uh, you know, large, large gap between you know when the la- like when the last time they did a a survey or whatever in the nineties to the last survey, um, mm-hmm. you know, 2020, I think it was maybe. Yeah. But yeah. And I mean, what they're, what they're proposing to do here, um, is it's pretty limited really. I mean, they're not, they're just, I think it's like three or four, um, of these, they're now calling them designated bear management areas. The, the commission officially changed that terminology away from sanctuaries. Um, but I think they're only opening three or four of them for some, some pretty limited lottery hunts. Right. Uh, So, you know, they already have a a pretty long, a very long standing culture of, of bear hunting with hounds there in, uh, in North Carolina. So they do a good job of managing their, their populations. I think they're just trying to stay on top of it as it continues to grow. Right. Right. So basically, you know, if they are, it doesn't sound like they are. It sounds like we're we're probably going to win this one here. But mm-hmm. if we don't, you know, there's definitely going to be more bear human interaction because a lot of the of that sanctuary area or the those designated bear areas are almost landlocked in a way from with mm-hmm. private lands. Um, right. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. I mean, there's, there is some public land opportunity in North Carolina. Um, but you know, historically bear hunters have seen their access to, um, places that they used to hunt on private land. They've seen that access dwindle just in the face of development and a growing human population there. Which, yeah, it's pretty much the case everywhere. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You can't escape that. God, yeah, it's so crazy. <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's let's talk about the next one here. So Utah's got something going on. Um, I think that's the Houses Act, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's that's Senator Mike Lee's Houses Act, which I guess was introduced to the Senate in April um, of this year. Okay. And but, if you could tell us what that's about and yeah, basically that um, is a bill that he has put forth in the U S Senate that proposes to take some federally managed BLM land and um, free it up for purchase by uh, state and local municipalities in there in Utah, where he's a senator in Utah. So it kind of focuses on Utah, but it wouldn't be exclusive to Utah. Um, but it would basically make those lands affordable to the municipalities, which would then um, be required to sell that land to developers for uh, specifically for housing development. So that's that's federally managed BLM land in across the West that would become potentially become uh, housing developments if this bill were to go through. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I know it sounds like it might be pretty obvious, but like, let's talk about how that affects us and, and uh, maybe get into like the long-term implications of that for wildlife. Yeah. I mean, if the bill were to go through, um, it's it represents pretty significant risk to um, wildlife habitat, obviously, uh, not just in Utah, but all over the western U.S. Um, these animals rely on 
on public land for all kinds of all kinds of things from just their natural everyday forage to winter range um so so once you start taking land out of um out of public hands and putting housing developments on it which this is what this bill proposes then you obviously have that habitat loss that comes along uh, with that kind of thing and then there's a, a big loss of access for hunters and other outdoor recreation recreators that have traditionally used this type of land so it's kind of twofold between the habitat loss for our, our wildlife and our loss of traditional access to these lands yes um so i mean this is not just a utah thing right so it, it we could potentially as hunters and sportsmen have our are potentially lose thousands and thousands of acres that are open mm-hmm. for us to hunt. Right. And yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. W- I'm sorry. With that, obviously comes the ramifications for the wildlife using those, that landscape, because we already know, you know, especially like mule deer, mule deer are very affected by defragmentation of their, of their landscape. Right. Um, they're they're not as adaptable as the whitetail or whatever that'll you know sleep underneath your back deck because you you know <laughs> that's how they are and right. mule deer just don't do that. I mean, some of them do. Some of them kind of grown up that way, and you'll see that in like Estes Park area and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. you know, this this is bad. This is a very 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 bad bill. Like if it right. goes through, I think this is definitely one that the troops need to rally behind. And I don't really, haven't really seen a lot of movement from, from us on it, to be honest with you. Um, Mm -hmm. I know from Howful Wildlife specifically, I'll pull that up right now. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering how many signatures it has. Not a whole lot. 20, almost 2,300, which Mm -hmm. is, when it's something this, you know, egregious or, you know, impactful, I guess is a better way to put it. Um, right. To to hunters and wildlife directly, like the, we, I think we need to we need to really get get on this one here, guys. So, you know, don't sit on your hawks. Um, yeah, yeah, it's an important. It's an important thing to try to fight this. I mean, Mike Lee is, he has a long standing history uh, throughout his tenure in the Senate of trying to transfer federally managed land um, out of federal hands kind of into the state, or in this case, local municipalities where it, it can then be sold off to private interests. And once it's gone, it's gone forever. Yeah. And it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's access that's lost and it's, it's wildlife habitat and both of those things are, you know, already dwindling. So do you know if BHA is working on that at all? Yeah. Well, it I don't, sounds like I, that's like right in their wheelhouse or what their mission yeah. is. But I don't yeah, know. they've been definitely on top of this one since the bill was introduced. And even, you know, I heard some rumblings about it before it, it was even introduced in the Senate. Um, but they have they have a portal that sends sends people to um, to Mike Lee and they're sending a ton of letters. Uh, I talked to Land Tawny whenever I reported on this for Meat Eater back when it first um, made news, and he kind of indicated to me that it, he didn't think this bill would have much support in the Senate, um, and he'd be surprised if it even got out of the committee. Mm-hmm. Um, just, I think bills like this that, that kind of tend to, or attempt to steal land from the American people, they just don't go over very well with people outside of maybe outside of Mike Lee's direct constituency. Right. Uh, once they get a national, in a national spotlight, the uprising can be pretty fierce. And it has been in the past for similar efforts that. Mike Lee and other like-minded politicians are put forth. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Like for me, I think that, 
that mentality that it's I know guys have been around this stuff for long and you know have seen it but I think that mentality is dangerous to oh, yeah. that sit back on your hawks and just oh, I don't you know I don't think or I don't whatever this is you know too outlandish especially nowadays like I mean look what's going on in this world like this is I think we got to be super heated and and mm. and fired up about every little every little thing that comes up and just fight tooth and nail like, I agree it's one of the things that drives me insane like to see when I open up the action center and I see something like this and there's only 2,400 or 2,300 signatures or whatever. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. we have 40,000 plus members on alpha wildlife Mm -hmm. or or members and users, you know, I'm like, Mm -hmm. why don't we have 40,000 signatures? Right. You know, we have 16 Mm -hmm. million hunters why don't we have 16 million signatures you know like right the, the, we we shouldn't be losing anything we should mm-hmm. be working like I, I mean it is our goal to to start working to get stuff that we've lost in the past back you right. know mm-hmm. you, the, you know these lion like lion hunting in california or something like that we want to we want to be able to work on that stuff it shouldn't right. be that hard to just get on here and drop a signature. This is this is big stuff. Um, again, oh, I know yeah. it seems like it might be to you know easily uh, you know what's the word I'm looking for like brushed off or whatever. But it's like mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Like there's too much of this stuff going on right now. There's there's a lot of land, a lot of land issues going on. Matter of fact, we're going to get into this next one here. I want to talk about Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, what what's going on over there? Oh, uh, New Jersey. So there is a bill, and I believe it's in the New Jersey House. Um, but it it would it basically takes a an existing buffer zone um, for people that are hunting with archery equipment say Mm -hmm. um at the moment you you have to be 150 feet from a residential dwelling i think Mm -hmm. uh with your archery equipment you cannot hunt inside that zone but it's going to take that and extend it out to about 450 feet um and you know that's just one portion of it the other uh maybe even more egregious part of that bill is that it, it requires private landowners in the state of New Jersey to inform all adjacent property owners of their plans to hunt mm-hmm. that, that property that they own. Um, so you would have to send a letter to or somehow inform a, your neighbors that you plan to deer hunt on your property. And then before you could go through with your hunting plans, you have to receive a some sort of receipt from uh, those neighbors, which is absolutely uh, ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, um, I, I know this is not necessarily. I mean, it, it does affect public lands too, and I'll get into that in a minute. But mm-hmm. to me, think about this. Let's say I'm I'm a guy that owns I don't know three acres, which. Mm-hmm doesn't sound like a lot especially us western guys three acres is nothing but as you're talking to a guy that hunts a five acre lot has hunted one acre lots for whitetail back east many many times yeah so if i own let's say a two acre parcel my house is on it and my neighbor you know my neighbor to the right of me doesn't want me to hunt Mm mm-hmm then I can't hunt on my land, you know? Right. Let's, or let's say that, let's say that all of them agree that I could hunt and we just went to 450 feet versus a hundred or was it yards or feet? I think it's feet, isn't it? Oh, I think it's yards. Actually. I'm on a misspoken and said feet. Okay. I think it's yards. 
So now when you're talking about two acres, depending on the relation, you know, the, the, where my house is located on my land, let's say, or excuse me, my, my neighbor's house is located on his land. Let's say he's kind of right up against the boundary. Now Mm. I'm going to lose 150 yards of my own property that I cannot hunt because, because of this law, you know? Right. And it's, you know, the same thing goes for public lands. Like back East where I, or in Long Island where I hunt, there's these little tracks, you know, of couple acres, several acres of, of land in between housing that mm-hmm. have crap ton of deer, lots of deer, Suffolk County. I'm going right. to bring up because I'm going to speak sp- specifically to this because I, I know it well. Suffolk County. So you're, you're from, originally from yeah. uh, the Northeast. Correct. I, I've been living in Arizona since 1991. So I've been here for 30, almost 31 years. In August, it'll be okay. 31 years. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty much a zoney. I've been in Arizona for way longer than I was in New York, but I go back and my wife is from New York too. We go back okay. every year and I go hunting there almost every single year. So, yeah. um, and they got a lot of white tails tons, in uh, New Jersey and New York, right? tons, tons, tons. Th- yeah. Those states, those areas have like one of the highest, if not the highest in the country for deer vehicle collisions, nuisance mm-hmm. problems with deer eating, you know, landscaping and tick problem. Like you wouldn't believe, um, mm-hmm. you know, so there's all this stuff there that, so these deer definitely need to be managed 100%. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, in New York, if you shoot a doe, you bring the doe to get it checked in, they will give you another tag of either sex tag. And wow. You could, you could do that twice. Like that's how many deer are there. So you have a problem with deer and this is the same thing with Jersey. You know, you have this, this issue and you're effectively cutting off the main tool to managing this problem off at the knees right. by constantly whacking away at the ability to actually hunt. Right. You know, the, the, pro- you- the problem is, is in these suburban areas. You can't like, okay, oh yeah, I could still go to, you know, the national forest or go to a large track that's, you know, thousands of acres and go hunt. But that's not where the problem of the deer is, and that's not mm-hmm. going to fix the problem that you're having. Right. So. Yeah, because whitetails, they like that edge habitat. They, they're they on the edge of uh, human yeah. occupation. Yeah, that's kind of where they, they congregate. So you, you, they're taking away that opportunity to, to manage those populations. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and now this is – one of the things that I've been trying to get people to understand, um, going back to that little conversation we have, like, why don't we have 35,000 signatures, 40,000 signatures, mm. is, you know, the, you and me, we're out here in the West, you're in Montana, I'm here in Arizona. How does this affect us, right? It, and people don't realize that you, if you lose, if you lose hunters because they can no longer hunt in their state, your voice gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually that's going to trickle back to you. Yeah. Um, it's going to come in, in, in the way of uh, legal precedence. It's going to come in the fact that there's less money being put in the pot. So we all contribute into the same pot. You can't think mm-hmm. of it as you're not doing it as in a state level. You, I mean, you are at, at certain, you know, tag sales or whatever, but when it comes to, uh, you know, Pittman Robinson and stuff like that. That is a large pot that the whole country puts into and then it gets divvied up. Well, that pot keeps right. getting smaller. So people need to understand that we're, we're only, we only exist because of that pot. Because right. without us, us, there would not be a mechanism to run conservation. Mm-hmm. And it's what protects us on a great, on a grander scale. That's why we're, right. that's why we're constantly dealing with the, uh, you know, death by a million cuts. Cause there's chipping away yeah. at the edges all the time, chipping away at the edges yeah. all the time because they can't do something like, Oh, let's get rid of deer hunting, you know, because 
Mm-hmm. But you start losing stuff like this, and it just people just don't want to deal with it. I can't even hunt on my own land. Why? Why? You know, that's where I got into bow hunting for. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna do this anymore. So now that guy's not buying bows, and he's not, you know. So exactly, yeah. yeah it's just it's it's a crazy thing. So I just kind of want to just keep hitting that home for yeah. people to understand sure. that. Um, right. Yeah. It's um like you said, the death by a thousand cuts strategy. That's their their most successful when i say they i mean the animal the organized animal rights activist Mm -hmm. coalition uh, that's their most successful route um, as far as limiting opportunities and the the more convoluted and um hard to discern they can make these efforts the better for them because they kind of tend to go under the radar oh yeah whenever they don't cause a huge uprising yeah like this thing well, this is challenges private property rights and limits people's abilities to hunt on their own land. So it, it should cause a big uprising, but it, it is pretty convoluted in the language of the bill. It's like most of these attacks tend to be. Yes, for sure. Um, so I, I, I kind of left this one for last and we might actually touch on another one that you, you looked into a little bit, but the New York has the lead ban Bill, uh, mm-hmm. I want you to describe that, and then I kind of want to kind of gotta dive into because at first it's like, okay, I mean, so we got to shoot copper bullets or whatever the case might be, but it's it, mm-hmm. it's a little bit more uh, complex. So, yeah, yeah. So the lead bands get tricky because um, on first glance you tend to think, well, that's probably a good thing to to limit lead on the landscape as much as possible through the the use of lead ammunition. Um, but it's, it's kind of like anything else in, in my opinion, and there are all kinds of opinions on lead. So, you know, people go in all kinds of different directions on this, but mm-hmm. it seems like it it's better um, kind of governed by this, the wildlife agencies, the state wildlife agencies and the scientists and biologists that work there. In my opinion, I think the, lead bands should be if they're going to be put in place at all they should be put in place by those professionals um, but this is one that's kind of like um it would just be a legislative prohibition on um, almost all state-owned public land in new york i think um and yeah it would just outlaw all lead ammo use on um, state-owned land and all the land within the the water supply that feeds into the water supply of New York city. Right. Um, so yeah, very, a large sweeping ban on lead. And you know, what that does is it, it tends to keep people away from hunting and fishing. It, it works against new hunter recruitment efforts. Um, obviously lead ammo is less expensive than some of the copper and other uh, alternatives, but, so it, it will it will weed out hunters, new hunters, and even existing hunters in New York. Um, yeah, and that goes back to what we were just talking about: the pot getting smaller. Right, the Pittman Robertson dollars uh, will continue to dwindle in the face of something like this. Yeah, and I, um, for those of you who are interested in it or not, on my personal podcast on Days in the Wild, I um, I did a. Uh, we t- talked specifically about lead and lead poisoning. And I had a, a gentleman, Dr. Brosdale, on uh, to oh, talk nice. about that. And it's a it's it's pretty good. We're not going to get into that right now. But if you want to listen to that, there's there's a lot uh, there's a lot of research as to why and and you know what and whatnot. So just uh, yeah, take a look at that, and you'll kind of find out a little bit more about it. Um, but uh yeah so the lead ban it's on 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 the grand scale of things is not a good thing for us i guess and mm-hmm. um i don't know if it doesn't seem like that uh, at least not this particular attempt to regulate lead um that's not to say that that lead should ammo shouldn't be uh, regulated in certain circumstances because there there's a lot of good science that 
that shows that, you know, raptors uh, such as condors and bald eagles that will ingest lead fragments from gut piles will ultimately die from that that toxicity. Um, but again, I think it goes back to we need to empower our state agencies to make these decisions and not use these uh, sweeping legislative efforts because they kind of get, they tend to get co-opted just like everything else in the legislature that has to do with hunting. Mm -hmm. Uh, The center for biological diversity or whatever it might be, will get behind an effort and then, and kind of use that to advance their goals of limiting hunting opportunity. Um, Whereas if it's just done on a case by case basis, by our wildlife agencies, I think that's a better outlook for this or a solution to this lead problem that we have. Right. Yeah. Like obviously if there is a, uh, an area that is specifically, uh, I don't know, California condor or whatever, where Mm -hmm. they're, that is an issue. That is a problem. That is a known problem that we're having with the lead. And right. Yeah. And then, uh, you mentioned the water supply, you know, we've already eliminated lead from waterfowl hunting. Mm-hmm. You know, federal, exactly. That, like those make sense to me, but you know, to go shoot a deer in the woods, right. That you're not going to have, you know, a condor in there or it's not open country where you're even going to have vultures or raptors or whatever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like a prudent thing to do, you know? Yeah. And with the water, water supply uh, issue in particular there in New York city or New York state, the water that feeds to New York city. um, I was reading something about, you know, they have so many of these, shooting ranges on public land throughout that watershed uh, where, you know, they, they go back however many decades of people just constantly uh, range shooting lead ammo. Mm -hmm. um, And, and they, that hasn't contaminated the water supply. So why do we have a reason to believe that, you know, further big game hunting in the Adirondacks where people are hunting white tailed deer, with, with lead ammo is going to be problematic. You know, if, if it's not, if it's not already proven from these shooting ranges that have existed for a long time. Right. Right. Well, cool. Um, I do want to close with this just to bring it up. Um, there's a bill in Washington, uh, not bill, but it, there's a, a situation in Washington that I want to mm-hmm. touch on. I'm actually going to be doing a podcast with uh, Bart George, who is uh, the lion guy. We'll, we'll call him the lion guy in in, uh, in Washington. Um, yeah. That will will be specifically talking about this and have it really, um, you know, flesh it out. But let's let's just give a quick overview. So there's a problem right now in Washington in the blue. Blue Mountain elk herd, mm-hmm. um, which used to be the largest single herd, I think, in the country. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, I believe it was. And yeah. now is um, on the decline. Right. Drastically. Yep. And yeah, it seems that way. Um, they, they have an... Un- a um, ungulate herd there that they've been studying the department, Washington department of fish and wildlife has been studying pretty heavily over the last year, um, monitoring um, calf growth rate, I think. So they collared a whole bunch of calves and elk calves in that, in that herd and found that their predation rates are just kind of through the roof. Um, something crazy like i don't know 80 percent or more of these calves had succumbed to some form of predation um and in a pretty huge number um portion of that was 
attributed to mountain lion predation. Yeah, I got the exact numbers here. I think I just pulled it up. So, um, there is. Hold on a second here. Um. Oh, I thought I had it right in front of me. I'm sorry, guys. Um, trying to find out how many they collared. I think they collared 125 animals. Yep. Yep. And uh, 92 of them, or something like that, was. I don't have the numbers exactly, but I have 90. I want to say 92 of them were were killed by predation. Um, mm-hmm. Or I'm sorry, there was only nine alive or something like that. Like, yeah, I think that's what, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, nine yeah, yeah. of them survived. Nine that, of them survived. They, okay, they and uh, 77 of those deaths were directly related to mountain lions. Okay, yeah, I think what I have is 77 were as a result of some form of predation, but 55 uh, deaths were attributed directly to cougars. Okay, yep, you're right. That's exactly it. Sorry, guys, we we should have had our numbers. I wasn't prepared to talk about this one, but I know I wanted to touch on it real quick. Um, yeah. And the rest were black bears, uh, wolves, and even they yeah. even determined that one or two of them were killed by bobcats too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they got a big predator problem there. And yes. right now... There's a proposition to uh, add an additional lion tag. And mm-hmm. so, you know, there's some there's some people out there that think, well, that's just not going to do anything because we don't even meet the quota. But if you look at it from the standpoint that this is one of the things that we need to check, uh, the box that we need to check um, uh, it's not going to hurt anything to put another to be able to get another lion tag there. It's not going to hurt right. anyone. Heck, it might even help by putting some more money out there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Are we going to be taking more lions if people get more tags? I don't know. Probably not. There's a couple of people that said, you know, you might see five or six more lions taken out a year. A year. Mm-hmm. Well, five or six more lions. If you do the math, you know, let's say six lions times 52, that's 312 animals, you know, undulates that you just saved. Um, that's not a small number, you know, but, right. um, but the whole thing is the whole premise behind it is you need to have more tags there. And let's say we put the more tags there and the, um, you know, in two years, you relook at it and say, hey, well, listen, we still haven't met this objective. Mm-hmm. Now let's go to the next step. Let's allow right. hound hunting again, or let's allow, because you can't hound hunt there. Right. Right. Yeah. It's been outlawed since the 90s, or I think. Yeah. You know, they followed suit with California. So, mm-hmm. but it's like, you can't, you can't make changes it, you know, or you can't hope that everything's going to change in one shot. But if you may, if you do this, now you have something to point to. You're like, look, we even increased the line tag. We're still not getting there. What what can we do? What tool can we use? We know this is effective. Let's do that. Mm-hmm. You know, right. So you have right. to have those those steps to to point to. And I don't think people are understanding that a lot of so a lot of people with our, up in arms about it, saying, oh, this is just a you know like a shell game. It's just going to make people right. feel like we're doing something and we're not doing anything with it and, and like yada, mm-hmm. yada, yada. So from my perspective um, and Hal's perspective, this is just a necessary thing that we need to do to go to the next step. Right. So we're yeah, supporting it. It seems like they're in Washington. Um, people are going to have to play the long game because that commission um, has – recent some new appointees that um you know some people don't think are really soundly rooted in the north american model of wildlife conservation so yeah yeah that's people are gonna have to be willing to like you said just yeah engage in this step this is one step in the process it's not it's not going to be a viable solution for the predator problem that they have there 
no. um, but it's participation and it's an opportunity to um, engage and voice your opinion, I guess, if nothing else. Exactly. Well, awesome, man. I want to thank you for coming on and going through these with us. And uh, yeah. we'll definitely uh, we'll get you back on here and, and probably next month and we'll talk about a few more other ones. Awesome, John. Well, I've, I've enjoyed it. I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate all the work uh, you guys are doing and the opportunity to help uh, craft some of these these actions. No, no problem at all. Then thank you for your 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 help on them. We need it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to help. All right. Have a good one. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.